بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم Welcome to part one of being a Muslim Inshallah al-Aziz this class is specifically for those that are new to Islam that have converted, reverted or that are just starting to learn about their religion once again Inshallah as converts or reverts to the religion, we need to have some sources. Our first resource is the clear Quran by Mustafa Khattab or the Quran by Abdul Halim, m.a.s. Both of these are very beautiful translations. The first one is more simple. It is written in beautiful language. It's not archaic in its tone or Victorian in its style. And the Quran by Abdul Halim is more of an academic translation. However, it is also a very good translation. The third source, which I think is the most vital, is a book called Being Muslim by Asad Tarsi. And that's the actual crux or the actual foundation or the book that I will be using to create these PowerPoints in order to explain Islam to you. However, there is a disclaimer that I would like to make. Not everything in that book is things that I agree with especially when it comes to the fiqh or the practice of ritual practices that happen within that book. So again, you should get that book. It is a great reference. But again, you should also watch the videos so that you can get a clear picture of what and how things actually are. Now, the first thing is, do we have to buy this book, right? Do we have to buy this book? The thing is, it's better if you buy it. It's better if you buy it. Again, it serves as a reference. The book is called Being Muslim by Asad Tarsi. In this book, he covers a huge plethora of issues. Number one, he talks about the creation as a whole. How did creation come to be? Islam in context. When did Islam really start? Uh, learning about Islam, how we go about learning about it. The role of the Arabic language, the Islamic belief system. What are the core tenets or what are the core things that we as Muslims affirm and believe in? Islamic ritual worship law, which is, for example, prayer, fasting, giving alms, uh, the testimony of faith, and so on and so forth. The next thing is spiritual refinement. How do we purify our hearts? Islam is not simply a religion of actions, but it is a religion that takes care of the inner dimension as well as the outer dimension, right? And the role of the Prophet, which is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his brief biography, major themes of the Quran, Islamic holidays, and Islam on miscellaneous issues, for example, appearance, dress, and manners, and so on and so forth. And now this may seem like a lot. We will go into each of these things in detail. Don't worry. Don't get frightened. These things will come to you slowly. And inshallah, you will be able to understand all of these things in a wholesome way. Right? And now again, why did I choose this book? Why do I choose this book as my reference book? Number one, the book is not too narrow and it's not too vast. It doesn't cover too much stuff, but it doesn't cover too little stuff. It covers the right amount of stuff. I have never seen a book written like it before, and it's probably one of the best books out in the market right now, right? And again, this book, it talks about the three main things. It talks about Islam, which is the practical to-dos. Islam is a subcategory, right? It's the pra uh, within the religion of Islam itself. It talks about the practical to-dos, Iman, which is faith or what to believe, right? And Ihsan, excellence, how the inner soul connects and excels towards God, right? Because the point of all of this stuff is to connect towards God, is to have our heart connected towards God and ultimately happiness and other virtues. Like how do we attain them? So Islam, it number one, it takes care of rituals, of the actions of the limbs. It takes care of the mind. It takes care of the beliefs that you have and it takes care of the heart and purifying it and all of the diseases that come with it, right? The spiritual diseases, not the physical diseases, right? And now, Again, the other reason why I chose the book is that most books are archaic in nature and written in Victorian English. The tone and style is based off of that. Or they take a reductionist approach. What is a reduction approach? They just make all of religion all about actions and to do, to do, to do, to do. And to do is important. We're not saying that to do is not important. But again, as Muslims, we have to look at our religion at a wholesome level, at a complete level, right? And again, when you look at it at a reductionist approach, then you end up killing the aspect of spirituality or the aspect of theology and belief, right? So you have to look at it and you have to ask the questions of why, like why this, why that? And again, the book, it gives a systematic approach 
while not neglecting the inner aspects of religion, which I really appreciate. Unfortunately, most books neglect this aspect, but we as Muslims need to really look at these aspects as well. So again, do I need to purchase it? Yes, as a reference book, if you would like to read it. But if you don't want to purchase it, all of the PowerPoints, inshallah, will summarize that book and will add additional details to help the book become more clear. Again, you don't need to have the book. The PowerPoints will be sufficient, right? But it's better if you buy the book, right? It's what we call mustahab or recommended to buy the book. So that's why I say yes. Yes, as in a recommendation. Now, the next thing that we're going to talk about is humanity and its unique trait. What makes us truly human? And why does all of this matter, right? So again, we will talk about these stories as we progress. The first thing that I want to talk about is the story of Adam. Because a lot of us might have came from Christian backgrounds and we need to really retweak our understanding of the story of Adam. So the story of Adam, it begins in the heavens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he had created a world of two creatures. He had created a jinn kind and he had created the, the angels. He had created these two kinds. And the angels were obedient to God and the jinn were those that had choices. They, were, they could either choose to obey or disobey. Angels were made of light, jinn were made of fire. Right? And the jinn, a lot of them, they did atrocious acts on earth. They killed and they fought and they spread the blood of each other on earth. So what happened is that God was deciding to create the next type of creature, which was humans. The angels, they questioned God and not a question to doubt God, but a question to inquire, to learn that why would you create another creature that could possibly, you know, spread blood, spread mischief on earth. And God, he responds to them and says that I know not, I know that which you do not know. Right. And the angels, you know, they're obedient. They, they, they agree with God. And then God, he says, that I created Adam and I taught Adam the names of things. I gave Adam the ability to learn, right? I gave Adam the ability to learn. So he turns to the angels. God turns to the angels and he asks the angels to name those things. And the angels, they say, we can't name those things. We can only name that which you have taught us, right? But yet here is Adam. God taught him how to speak. And greater than all of that, God taught him the ability to choose between right and wrong. That's what makes us uniquely human, that we have an intellect, we have intelligence, we have choice. That intellect and choice that we have makes us truly human and truly unique. And that's the challenge of the human being. The challenge is to choose that which is between right and wrong. And that's what made Adam unique. And again, after Adam was created, we know the story. What happened is that God, he created from Adam, his wife, Eve, Hawa. And then they ended up eating from an apple tree uh, where God told them not to eat from that apple tree. And because of that, God took Adam out of heaven. And all of this was because of the devil's plot or shaitan's plot, right? Now, a lot of times that we think that, you know, when Adam did this, it was a mistake. It was not a sin. Right? It was a mistake. Eating from a tree is not a sin. Right? Eating from a tree, like if you ate from an apple tree, you think it's a sin? No, it's not a sin. But the reason why it was a mistake was because he, Adam, for that moment that he ate the apple, he forgot about his Lord. Right. So for example, a person forgets to pray or he forgets to do something, right? He is not as held accountable until he remembers, right? And in the same way, Adam is not held accountable until he remembered. And as soon as Adam remembered, he sought the forgiveness of God. He said, oh, Allah, forgive me. Hawa said, oh, Allah, forgive me. Eve said, oh, Allah, forgive me. So how could you hold somebody responsible for something that they've already asked forgiveness for? So Islam unilaterally, completely denies the idea of the original sin. We don't believe in the original sin, right? So again, those are that's just the basic crux of the story of Adam. The first part is what makes him special, what makes us all special. The second part is the idea of the original sin. It's something that Muslims deny. Every single person will be judged according to themselves. No son will inherit the sins of his father and no father will inherit the sins of his son, right? And vice versa, you know, right? In all of the different directions. Now, the role of knowledge in Islam. 
Knowledge is something that every single Muslim must seek, every single convert, every single revert must seek. We cannot become complacent when it comes to knowledge. That seeking knowledge is necessary for every type of Muslim, for every type of Muslim. And now the difference between Fard Ain and Fard Kifaya comes next. Fard Ain and Fard Kifaya are two different terms. Fard Ain literally refers to those that are singular obligations upon yourself. They're singular obligations upon yourself. For example, praying Salah, for example, giving Zakat, for example, going to Hajj, meaning you don't need to do them in a group. They're done by yourself. You are required to do them. And like that, there is what we call fard ain knowledge or knowledge which is required upon each single individual, right? That each single individual must know, each single individual Muslim must know, right? And that is the knowledge that is, you know, the bare minimum, right? Now there is fard kifaya. Fard kifaya is when one Muslim is an obligation where one Muslim in a community, if he takes care of it, then the rest of them are not sin, they're sinful because of it. But if he does not take care of it, if one person does not take care of it, then everyone is sinful. So what type of knowledge is this? That's the knowledge of the scholar. There should always be one scholar in a community in, in able to teach the Muslims. And the Muslims should work to producing such a scholar. They should send somebody out to go study and come back and teach them. Right. This is known as fard kifaya, and like that, there are what we call fard kifaya actions. For example, the funeral prayer. The funeral prayer. If a Muslim dies and one person prays it, then Alhamdulillah, nobody else is sinful. But if a funeral, if somebody dies and it's a Muslim person and no one in the community prays his prayer, then everyone is sinful. So I hope that's clear. If it's not clear, go back in the recording and understand it. So there is what we call fard ain knowledge, which is individual knowledge every Muslim should know. Fard kifaya knowledge, which a specific person is supposed to know, for example, a scholar. Then there's fard in actions, which each individual must Muslim must know how to do and do itself. And fard kifaya actions, which are a group action, which if only one person does, then it suffices for the rest of the people. Now, what is Islam? So the way that we define Islam is number one, one of the ways of defining things is by defining what is what it is not. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, a very illustrious scholar, he says that should any ruling go from cruel, from mercy to cruelty, it is not Islam. Should it go from wisdom to folly, meaning the lack of wisdom, it is not Islam. Should it go from benefit to harm, then it is not Islam. And should it go from justice to injustice, it is not Islam. So Islam is mercy. Islam is wisdom. Islam is benefit. Islam is justice. Islam is not cruelty, it is not folly, it is not harm, and it is not injustice. If you understand this, then everything that comes to you, you will have a criterion or a mi'yar or a standard for understanding, is this from Islam or not? But again, when we look at this, we try to look at the wisdoms, right? Sometimes we might not understand something in our religion. It might be something that, uh, you know, is not making sense to us. But again, if we really truly look, we will find that in that concept of religion, there is mercy, that there is wisdom, that there is justice, and there is benefit for ourselves. Islam doesn't command us to do anything except that which is beneficial for ourselves. Now, what's the definition? There is a linguistic definition or that which is based off of language, right? Which means to submit. But when we talk about Islam as a whole, when we talk about it as a technical definition, when you talk to a Muslim about Islam, the actual definition of Islam is submission to the will of the creator by following divine guidance that has reached us through the medium of the prophets, specifically the final prophet, which is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that's what Islam actually is. It is all of that. It's to submit to the will of the creator, to the will of God by following that which he's commanded you and who's given you all of this information? It is none other than the prophets of God. So that's what Islam essentially is. And all of this is in order to gain peace. So sometimes you'll hear people say Islam is peace. Yes, Islam is peace, right? It means peace as well. However, in reality, it is submission. It is, it is peace gained through submission to the will of the divine through the way of the prophets. Now, Islam and its central values. Islam's central values include justice, mercy, wisdom, or benefit, the things that we covered before, right? And before we end class, I just want to share one quote. The religion itself is vast like the ocean. Within its wondrous ocean, some must become master swimmers, 
However, all people must begin to simply learn to tread water. This is a quote by Hamza Yusuf, who converted in, I believe, in the 1970s, if I'm not correct, if I'm not wrong. He went and he studied Islam abroad. He is a Caucasian man who converted to Islam at that time. And mashallah, he is one of the illuminary scholars of the West. There are certain opinions of his that I don't agree with, political opinions and certain leanings that he has in religion that I don't agree with. However, this quote is very beautiful. It's, it just shows us that Islam is something that every single person must learn to tread and swim. It's like an ocean. There's a lot. But don't get afraid. Don't worry. Take your time. Learn everything. But go at your own pace. Not all of us will become expert swimmers. Master swimmers are those that are scholars. Not all of us will be scholars. But again, we need to learn how to at least tread. We need to learn at least how to move, right? Just a little bit in the water so that we can survive in this place known as the world. Now, the question is, what if I already had a head start and I know all of this? What am I supposed to do? Will I benefit from this class? Yes, you will benefit in two ways. Number one, if you don't know any of this stuff, then you will benefit from the knowledge. You will move from not knowing to knowing. But let's say you know all of this stuff, what this will do, it will give you a way to present Islam to other uh, you know, converts and other reverts and other people coming back to religion, right? I'm not here to just say that, learn from me, learn from me. No, I'm here to enable you to go out and teach other people about Islam. And again, we only teach that which we know. So I'm not giving you certificates to be scholars. No, no. That's not it. But I'm giving you the ability to teach the basic foundations of being a Muslim. And that's what our course is about. So if you are at that level, inshallah, you will benefit from that aspect. Inshallah, we will end because again, this is not a uh, live class with people in. This is just myself. So subhanakallahu bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa nastafiruka wa natubu ilayk.